<clears throat> well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, but before we get started with our tenant forum, we thought that, um, you know, it'd be best to just briefly, you know, address what's going on, you know, in our country, um, you know, when it comes to the police and our black and brown communities. Um, and so, like, for me personally, I just want to just, you know, let folks know if they're not doing this already, you know, it's a real tragic time. And for me personally, as a Latin woman, you know, a woman of color who has been directly affected with when it comes to um, over policing and, and, you know, abuses even by landlords, um, it's really important then doing this work, you know, working with many tenants in New York City and working with you know, a lot of different partners who are working around a lot of different issues. It's really important for folks to make sure, I believe in my opinion, is to practice self-care and to breathe. You know, it's really important, you know, even as tenants, you know, there are a lot of things coming around the corner, courts are gonna be opening. And so there's a lot that we as, as New Yorkers right now, as along with the rest of the world are going through a lot uh, mentally um, and physically probably and so just want to take the moment to also just pay respects for you know many of the people who have um, you know lost their lives due to um, the abuse of the NYPD um, but mostly just remind folks, you know, this is more important for us to stay united and to keep fighting because it's not only the police, it's the real estate market as well as we know, um, you know, and they they tend to use <laughs> forms of police, you know, with marshals when it comes to evictions and things like this. And so I think right now um, folks should really just, you know, breathe and take take some time for yourself um and you know if you can support the movement in any ways please do um you know many of our partners you know and coalitions are asking for defunding the nypd you know because many social services are being cut and it's especially now where we're going to need these things um and so really support you know, a lot of the coalitions who are fighting for reappealing 50A and cutting the budget. Um, and yeah, and just, you know, supporting our, our black and brown communities that are always, you know, being targeted again, when if it's not the police, there's the real estate industry and there's a lot of different um, <clears throat> harms. And so just wanted to just say that before we get started um, and start talking about the other, you know, the re another really important issue that, as we know, a lot of tenants are, are feeling the effects right now when it comes to um, not being able to pay their rent. So we're going through just getting over, you know, the COVID pandemic, then, I mean, over policing has always been an issue, but it's just more, um, you know, it's more present because of social media and all of this. And then now a lot of us, you know, are are not able to pay rent. And so um, it's a lot. And I personally believe, again, it's important to take care of your mental health. That's all. So, Pilar, I, I mean, I just want to thank you for your words and your, you know, your leadership in our city. And we are all a, a community together and we all, our voices matter. So it's really important that we uplift uh, so many voices and especially women of color and leadership roles in our city. It's really always joyful to hear from you even these during these dark and troubling times. My name is Harvey Epstein. I'm the assembly member in the 74th Assembly District. And I just want to welcome people who have joined us. I want to thank Councilman Kalos for sponsoring this as well as our borough president, Gail Brewer, our community boards, and all our other elected officials who are are part of this housing forum. 
I mean, our goal today is really to address uh, some basic information, basic principles that are going on, and we have a lot of great panelists. And the goal is to continue to focus on a, a diverse, rich New York. And what the real estate industry wants to do is to, to allow white, wealthy folks to live in parts of their city and not, and not to be really economically and racially diverse. And our job is to fight back, to try to create more opportunities for affordable housing in our city and state, promote accessible housing and senior housing. And as city, state, and federal officials, we need to act collectively in that way to make sure we have a more inclusive New York. So how do we do that? It includes protecting tenants who've lost their job, making sure they can get any of their unemployment, making sure we have resources available, and issues like trying to cancel rent and ensure that people with tenants can be protected to get subsidies available. The governor uh, had an executive order that expires on June 20th. I know Ellen from Legal Aid will talk more about it. Um, so there might be an extension for some people to August 20th, and there's some real questions about that extension. You know, COVID-19 has deeply impacted our city, state, and country most more, you know, acutely to communities of color and our undocumented community. So people who are not eligible for unemployment benefits, what so they're going to be able to, what support can they get? So we're here to talk about that, the housing struggle. People will ask questions about how the housing laws that we changed last year under the leadership of Senator Kavanaugh and Senator Kruger. And Senator Hoyleman, we were able to do some amazing things, um, but we still need to keep fighting. The Rent Guidelines Board obviously has an impact on the day-to-day -day lives of people, and knowing that there's a Rent Guidelines Board public hearing next week and a final vote on June 17th, I and my colleagues on the city and state level are pushing for at least a rent freeze. Those are the things we need. Those are the things that tenants need across our city and our state because we're going to come back, we're going to be a better New York, but what's the cost along the way? You know, who are going to be fought, uh, penalized? How many lives are going to be lost? How many homes are going to be lost? And that's the kind of conversation we need to have with you, an honest, real conversation. So, you know, please, with your questions, send them to us. We already have a lot of questions, and we have some great panelists. And I'm going to send it over to my co-sponsor, Councilman Kalos, to, to to move ourselves forward. Thank you, Ben, for all you do for our city. Thank you, Council Member Ben Kalos. I have the privilege of representing the East Side, East Harlem, East Midtown, Roosevelt Island. I want to thank all of you uh, for joining us. In particular, I want to start with a thank you to Pilar de Jesus for opening this event, uh, for sharing her lived experience to everyone who has been out there protesting uh, to uh, for, for George Floyd and the name of George Floyd to make sure it never happens to anyone ever again, to defund the NYPD. And uh, a thank you to my brothers and sisters in the Assembly and Senate. Uh, the cost of admission was that you had to be willing to repeal 50A. So I wanna thank them for their leadership. I also wanna thank uh, Harvey Epstein. I have known him for as long as I've been an elected official. Uh, he, he's been the city's housing attorney. He's been my housing attorney and uh, when I first got elected, the idea was to get everyone together, do this event each and every year, because each and every year the Rent Guidelines Board votes on your rents. And so working together with so many of our brothers and sisters in the housing movement, and we have so very many sponsors today, and I just want to acknowledge uh, just a handful of them. We have our Congress member, Carol Maloney, our Borough President, Gail Brewer, State Senator Liz Krueger, State Senator Brian Kavanaugh, State Senator Brad Hoyleman, Assembly Member Rebecca Seawright, Assembly Member Dan Court, Assembly Member Dick Gottfried, Assembly Member Robert Rodriguez, and my colleagues in the council, uh, Council Member Rivera, Keith Powers, and Diana Ayala. Uh, today you will hear presentations from Take Root Justice, uh, NIMIC, Lennox Hill, Legal Aid Society, Tenants and Neighbors, the Rent Justice Coalition, Met Council and Housing. Uh, when you RSVP, do you submitted questions? Uh, if you have new questions that come up, you can uh, tweet them to me at Ben Kalos, and you can also uh, share on the Facebook post if you're watching on Facebook. And uh, for Harvey, you can tweet Harvey at? Harvey for New York. Uh, and so we'll try to make sure we get to all those questions. And uh, I'm checking to see if we have Senator Liz Kruger on, because I know she also has an event tonight. And I don't think she is on. Uh, so we do have the housing chair 
for the Senate. He did amazing work when he was in the assembly, particularly around reform work. And as housing chair, he was able to pass a uh, housing package that no one ever thought possible. And so without further ado, if you could please join me in welcoming uh, State Senator Brian Kavanaugh to just share exactly a little bit of everything he's accomplished so far for us with the Senate and the Assembly and what's on deck. Great, I think, uh, have I successfully un unmuted myself? Um, okay, great, thank you very much. Um, I, I'll be brief and um, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, I think I'll focus, try to focus more on, um, you know, what lies ahead than, uh, you know, reliving past glories here. But um, I think that, you know, uh, Councilmember Kalis does make an important point, which is that the work done last year to pass the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act, which was the work of uh, obviously senators and assembly members um, and other elected officials who advocated, but also many of the organizations uh, on this call that are going to be speaking tonight, and not just last year, but really over the course of many years. So many people worked so hard to lay out a clear agenda, what was wrong with the um, the red stabilization laws, and uh, that resulted in really this extraordinary transformation of those laws and, and closing many, many loopholes. But also uh, because there was tremendous focus on uh, what is called commonly called good cause eviction, which I, I think probably will be discussed tonight, um, which is of course a set of law, a, a, it's a legal principle that would extend beyond the rent stabilized uh, stock. You know, there are about a million apartments that are rent stabilized. There are many millions in New York State that are not. Um, so that, although we did not get good cause, which I support and you know tried to achieve last year, uh, we did change a wide range of the laws around eviction, uh, increasing the rights of tenants uh, when they're at odds with their landlord. So I think that the work we did last year, all of us really does provide a good base for uh, the work we need to do now to protect tenants' rights. Um, this year, uh, you know, I think there are two big things that I'm focusing on the moment. One is the uh, eviction moratorium, which uh, is about to, uh, it, it, there's a blanket moratorium that is in place uh, for a few more weeks. Um, and then it is gonna be replaced uh, because the governor, although he has extended it, has effectively changed it to a much weaker uh, version of the moratorium. And it is going to, it is likely as currently written uh, to allow a great many eviction cases to proceed. Um, from my perspective, given where we are with the public health crisis, as well as with the economic crisis that is real from COVID-19, uh, that would be quite, um, sorry, I, I'm, I'm gonna use an understated word, quite problematic uh, for our city. Uh, it, it, you know, there were less polite and pleasant words for it, but really we are not in a position where we should be permitting large numbers of eviction cases to go forward, especially the, the tremendous glut of cases that are likely to um, arise as this, to get filed as the moratorium expires. So just to turn, it's a very, it's a short term and very, very important advocacy priority that we push for the governor to extend that moratorium, the blanket version of that moratorium further. And he had, he had suggested that this weaker moratorium is appropriate through August uh, 20th I think that seems like a reasonable day to extend the blanket moratorium at this moment. And so I, I know that others will talk about those in the call, but that's really critical. Um, the other thing, you know, we've been focusing on the needs of uh, homeowners and renters, um, obviously most especially renters, um, you know, in a world where people have lost jobs and income and are unable to pay their rent. Uh, we, did, we did some things last week around mortgages and property taxes and utility uh, shutoffs and a bunch of things that are sort of related to the housing sphere. But I just wanna focus now for a minute on the issue of paying people's rent. Um, we took a step last week, um, it's called the emergency uh, rent, it's, it's the ERRA, um, and it, it's a bill that puts a very modest amount of money out there, it's $100 million, um, and it is intended uh, to begin to cover some of the costs of rent that people are unable to pay. It focuses on some of the lower income, uh, renters. Uh, it is only a four-month program. It's April, May, June, and July. Um, and it is both a start, a real start, I think. Uh, maybe 25,000 households or so will get their rent paid. Uh, but it also it is, it is a tiny fraction of what we need to do. Um, and I'm the sponsor of that bill. And I'm, I'm saying, you know, 
we did what we could after a complicated negotiation in Albany. Um, but as usual, the first round of the negotiation did not yield what we really need. So from my perspective, it's a tremendous priority. You know, very short term, let's get that eviction moratorium extended so we don't have a catastrophe a few weeks from now. But the, the unpaid rent is going to be a looming catastrophe until we find a way to address it. And my proposal to address it is to get the Congress to put forth what the House of Representatives has already said uh, we should do, which is $100 billion of, of subsidies and support to protect tenants throughout the country. New York might get as much as $10 billion of that. Um, and we have a bill that I've worked on with Steve Simberwitz and uh, is sponsored by um, a majority of senators and many, many assembly members that is intended basically to create, lay out a program that would ensure that everybody's rent gets paid and also make sure that uh, people who are homeless who don't have rent to pay because they don't have a home to live in, um, that there's a sufficiently generous uh, set of subsidies to address that because as has been said in many contexts at this point, uh, housing is public health. We need to get people out of congregate settings and off the streets and out of public spaces and into permanent housing now more than ever. So that's been a crisis for a long time. It's even more of a crisis now. So uh, I, I see we have a few of my colleagues on in both the city and the state and I'll, I'll end there, but just to say, thank you to all the organizations that are represented here and are gonna to speak tonight. And thank you to uh, uh, our council member and our assembly member for uh, pulling this very important forum together. And thank you all for the opportunity for a few minutes. Uh, th and thank you, Brian, for all you do for our state. And I know we did some great housing bills over the last year under your leadership. And we look forward to extending the moratorium for all tenants and protecting as many as we can from the unlawful evictions. Just want to turn it over to I know Senator Hoyleman is on, and he's my senator, so I get to I get to rave about his leadership in New York State and how much he's done for our city and the state, and he's been an amazing ally to tenants and has done fabulous legislation over the last two years with them in leadership. And uh, Brad, thank you for what you do. Thanks for being. Senator. Thanks, Harvey, and thanks, thanks, Ben. Really, this is a great forum. You've got great guests. Look forward to hearing from them. Uh, really some of the best in the business I see uh, who, who serve as our, as our think tank. I wanna thank uh, also uh, housing chair Kavanaugh, who's done a terrific job. The, the, the man definitely knows his details uh, on the housing laws and it's he's such a great colleague and I'm, I'm really, really proud of his, his work. Um, and Harvey, you know, it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that when you were on the RGB had 0% increases. And as soon as you get to the assembly, we pass this historic tenant law reform. So, um, so thank you. Thank you for your leadership there. Uh, just a couple of points. One is we're in extraordinary times. I think that has to be acknowledged. Um, you know, housing is at the intersection of, of you know, race and, and class, which are some of the issues we're talking about. Um, you know, we probably should have our, our, our law enforcement, uh, you know, be housed in, in New York City um, as well. But th these are these are obviously much broader issues. Um, as to what we passed uh, in connection with COVID-19, I think Senator Kavanaugh is absolutely correct. We have to do more. We have that $100 million that we got from the Federal CARES Act. We're hoping that, you know, Carolyn Maloney and, and Nidia Velasquez can negotiate um, some of that three trillion that they got from the house to provide another tranche of um, funds, not just for um, not just for residential tenants, but also commercial tenants, the small businesses I know that are that are suffering uh, in, in our neighborhoods. Uh, I was happy to pass the with Senator Kruger um, a bill that we called the Tenant Safe Harbor Act, which um, with the assistance of, of legal aid, we wrote uh, and protects tenants in their homes uh, from eviction during the course of the stay at home orders, as well as if there are any arrears after those orders are lifted. It's not as a muscular protective device as, as we would have uh, wanted. Um, things are subject to negotiation. So we're gonna have to do more on that front too, because we're all worried that evictions are gonna be the, the order of the day um, once the courts are, you know, back in operation and landlords are seeking um, money judgments. Um, but at the moment, 
the very least, we've protected tenants from being kicked out of their homes. It's quite astounding to think that if you're a tenant who is dealing with a health crisis uh, of your own or a family member, you're homeschooling, you're unemployed, contacting Harvey, one of our offices for unemployment insurance help, you, you, know, you, you are also fearing eviction. We've removed for some period of time that concern. So I'm very interested in listening to the um, panel tonight and, and Harvey, my colleague, Caroline Wexelbaum, who many of you know is on the line. Uh, we've got so many issues, Harvey, and whether it's Stuy Town, uh, uh, the East Village, um, the Lower East Side, um, Midtown East and, and, and you know, Mitchell Lamas. Um, I'm, you're, you're a wonderful colleague and I'm, I'm glad to be of assistance with you. Uh, in Albany. Thanks. Thank you to State Senator uh, Brad Hoyleman. I'd like ne to now introduce uh, the assembly member uh, who, who uh, I overlap with and has represented me for quite a while. Uh, I'm lucky to have two. Uh, for over five years, she's been elected official. She's co sponsored 527 pieces of legislation, 30 and sponsored 30. Her bills have been signed into law requiring health insurance policy to include 3D mammography at no cost to the consumer, encouraging greater representation of women on corporate boards, and identifying how many policy making positions are held by women in New York State government. Inspired to renew the movement for the Federal Equal Rights Amendment to guarantee that our rights are anchored in our state and U.S. Constitution. She authored and passed the Equal Rights Amendment to our New York State Constitution. Please join me in welcoming Assemblymember Rebecca Seawright. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you, Councilman Kalos, and thank you to my colleague, uh, Assemblyman Harvey Epstein, for being the lead co-host on tonight's event and, and for inviting me to uh, join you. And a big shout out to Chairman Senator Kavanaugh, who my son was fortunate enough to intern for when he was a student at SUNY Albany and has fond memories, as well as my colleague, I see Assemblyman Robert Rodriguez. Um, I'm pleased to just join all of you and the wonderful advocacy organizations this evening who will be providing vital information tonight. Um, and Pillar, your words were very meaningful and special, so thank you for, for speaking. You know, I am deeply distressed by the shocking television images of violence in major cities across the country, including here in New York State. We must all stand in support of peaceful protest against bigotry and discrimination and for genuine criminal justice reform. It was so meaningful yesterday to walk beside my neighbors up York Avenue in solidarity and in memory of Black Lives Lost and against police misconduct. I'm a co-sponsor of repealing Article 58 and I'm hopeful and confident, along with my colleagues, that we will get that done next week. New Yorkers are facing unprecedented challenges as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Last week in Albany, in order to vote to pass a comprehensive package of legislation to address these challenges, including critical protections for tenants, as you heard Senator Kavanaugh and uh, Assemblyman Epstein and Senator Hoylman mentioned earlier, the COVID-19 pandemic has presented unprecedented challenges for families here in New York and all across the nation. Our neighbors are hurting. Businesses were forced to close their doors to the public, leaving millions of New Yorkers without jobs or furloughed since the pandemic began. Countless New Yorkers cannot pay their bills and struggle to put food on the table, let alone make their rent payments. To better support renters across the state who have lost their jobs and income, we passed emergency legislation, which you'll hear more about in greater detail later this evening. But we also need critical, significant federal stimulus funding out of Washington, D.C. to effectively and completely address the magnitude of these challenges and support people experiencing homelessness, renters, homeowners, Mitchell Lama residents, co-op and co condo owners, and NYCHA residents. Our office is working remotely, uh, answering many emails, calls, and uh, all of your requests for assistance. I invite you to join us on Tuesday for our virtual Town Hall Tuesday. Join us on Wednesday as we deliver food from Stanley Isaacs. And Tuesday, we sponsor a free housing clinic 
uh, virtually from our office, as well as delivering food on Fridays on Roosevelt Island. Thank you to my councilman, Councilman Ben Kalos, my assembly member colleague, Harvey Epstein, for sponsoring this this evening. And I also see my other council member, Keith Powers, uh, here on Zoom. Thank you for all joining in this evening. It was a pleasure to join each of you. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you for what you do. As you know, Rebecca and I are both CUNY law alums, so we have CUNY power we're fighting for as well. And yes. uh, Rebecca, thank you for your leadership. Uh, and so now we're lucky to have another colleague, uh, Robert Rodriguez, who's also in the assembly represents the um, East Harlem, uh, Upper East Side, Robert Snowman is a really good friend, but a real staunch advocate for the issues that we care about around affordable housing, public transportation, you know, can, you know, single-handedly got us congestion pricing and, and so brought money to the MTA. So Robert, thank you for being a friend and a colleague and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Harvey, and thank you, Ben, for, for hosting this important forum. And I'm so proud to see so many uh, colleagues in government coming together on an issue that we know is truly important. I mean, right now, I, I think uh, Rebecca mentioned uh, some of the work that we're doing around COVID-related reform, and I think next week we'll probably be in session trying to address criminal justice matters. Um, but I think most of it is trying to be responsive to, um, you know, not just the needs of our society, but really what we're hearing from constituents. And I think the challenge that we're all faced with is recognizing that, you know, the uh, economic situation is 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 difficult, um, but people still need to be able to put food on their on their tables. Um, still be able to, you know, keep a roof and shelter over their, over their head. And it's, uh, you know, the role of government to step up in those times of challenge. And I think that's really what, um, you know, we have done individually um, um, as leaders in our community, whether it's providing food or PPEs or um, equipment to help people deal with the initial um, challenges of COVID, or now where we know that people are dealing with unemployment and trying to figure out how to stay in their homes. So I think, you know, much of the conversation will, will probably center around that and around the initial steps that we've taken to provide, um, you know, rental subsidy, but about what, what, what has to happen next. And I'm really, really excited to be part of this conversation, part of trying to develop a solution that helps as many people as possible during this challenging time. And really the collaboration amongst colleagues and all levels of government to try to make this happen. We know how um, dependent on we are on on federal support, but um, you know I think what you see here is your city and your state um, elected officials, you know, looking to do whatever is necessary to try and help each one of our constituents make it through this time. So thank you, Harvey, and thank you, Ben, for for hosting this important dialogue. Thank you very much to Robert Rodriguez. It's a pleasure to work with you in representing portions of the district. Uh, I'd like to now introduce our state senator, uh, Liz Kruger. She is the finance chair in the Senate, and uh, she has stood with me to open affordable housing on the Upper East Side, including building supportive housing for formerly homeless women, uh, literally on our blocks across the street from where we live and uh, in the schools where, where our children go. And so it's just been a pleasure to work with her. She's always willing to stand up and have the courage of our convictions. If you can join me in welcoming State Senator Liz Kruger. Thank you, Ben. And hi to all my colleagues I can see in little boxes here tonight. Um, there is probably almost no more important issue than the future of housing and what we're gonna do about it in the city. And in fact, we're having competing housing discussions tonight. So I'm here to quickly say hello and then I'll be going to do my own Zoom event, specifically around the issues for condos and co-ops that we're seeing related to COVID. Um, but it's okay, you can stay and hear all of this and mine replays on Facebook whenever you would like to take a little more time um, for another Zoom. And we did one with Ellen Davidson from Legal Aid Society last week. Hi, Ellen. Um, I guess, you know, we all have the exact same things on our mind what is gonna to happen to the future of our city and our country. Um, I actually think that as upsetting and disturbing as what is happening in our own city with police over um, or abusing their authority when it comes to protesters and the concept that we're now living under a curfew, which in my opinion makes absolutely no sense, um, that while we are dealing with our own very difficult issues here at home, we have a president 
who's basically daring us to get him to create martial law and call in the military. I can't think of anything more terrifying, uh, frankly, in the history of this country since perhaps the Civil War as the dangerous, dangerous game that the president seems to be intentionally setting us up for. It's as if he has wanted to create chaos in our streets and chaos between good people since the minute he got into the White House. And he's getting awfully close to proverbially hitting that button for us. So I know a lot of us think, oh my God, one more crisis to deal with, just can't do it. But I think we will all have to remember, no matter how many struggles we are in, no matter how much pain we might personally be going through at this time, and a lot of us are, um, that we need to hold together with the strengths and the fact that we have far more commonalities than differences. That is the story of New York City from the beginning of time. And we're all going to need to be stronger and smarter um, to take on perhaps our national government in ways we never imagined in our lifetime. So now that I've depressed everyone a little more, I'm going to actually hand it over to, back to Ben for him to continue to hand it over. And I also saw my colleague, Brian Cavanaugh, the chair of our housing committee. So, you know, between all the people who are on tonight, we have the people with the right answers. So thank you all for the work you do every day. Thank you, Ben. Uh, uh, thank you, Liz. It's Harvey answering. Oh, sorry, sorry. Harvey. Thank you, Harvey. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, uh, and Liz, thank you for your leadership in the Senate. I mean, you're, the job you have right now is to deal with our state finances and, you know, and trying, you know, our Senate leadership is really important. So thank you, especially during these times of great fiscal crisis. As you know, I'm on board with taxing as many high income earners as we can. And when we go back to Albany, maybe not next week, sometime soon, that'll hopefully be on our list. Uh, we. We're also fortunate to have two amazing council members uh, who overlap in my district. I'm going to introduce a new bearded, I guess, bearded Keith Powers. <laughs> it's hard to tell. Uh, slightly bearded Keith Powers, who uh, does such amazing work uh, around criminal justice in the council and closing Rikers. And as a rent stabilized tenant himself in Stytown, cares deeply about these issues. So, Councilman Powers. Thank you. And uh, the beer, I mean, who has time to, to even think right now, let alone uh, a shape of beard. But thank you. Um, and nice to see so many friends here. I'm City Council Member Keith Powers. I represent uh, Stives in town, Waterside Plaza, East Midtown, Upper East Side, Midtown West, and many other areas in Manhattan. Um, and I have the great privilege of working with uh, almost everybody on here and uh, overlap or on, on related issues. Um, I won't say I won't say much because I know we've heard from a lot of electeds and probably getting tired of that part of it. And I, I'm going to go uh, out to one of the protests shortly. But um, I, I would just say the one thing I've been doing as we've gone through this COVID crisis is trying to track all the issues around housing and homelessness and public health and criminal justice and other issues that we have made some transformation on in the name of crisis to think about whether post this we can have a real serious conversation about how we move forward. We talk about in the criminal justice system, we're talking about releasing vulnerable individuals to put them back in their communities. How do we continue to do things like that? How in housing and in homelessness, are we, you, as we respond to the crisis, do we have an opportunity to think about issues differently? The one thing I would say, in addition to that is, you know, I, I don't know if anybody's mentioned this, but I, I say this often, the reforms that they did in Albany last year that do affect me, my family, and, and this community were important for the long-term future of, of housing. But it really was for, I think, moments like this where many individuals were going to be going through pain and uh, income loss and other issues so uh, related to you know, housing insecurity. And those reforms that Brad and, and Harvey and Rebecca and Liz, and I'm sure I remember, I remember somebody on here, uh, and Robert and others did, was about creating housing security. So I think we, we have a lot more to do. Thank you everybody for being part of this. Um, we have lots, lots to do on housing and it's housing insecurity and particularly homelessness in this city. And I'm just grateful for everybody who's doing so much. And, um, and lastly, 
I, I hope everybody is staying safe and healthy and particularly mentally healthy at a time where we really need it. And I do hope we're going to find some justice in a very difficult moment right now. So thank, thank you to Harvey and Ben. And thank you for Ben always for his, uh, his partnership on the East side. And, uh, and thanks everybody for, for keeping up a great fight. Thank you very much to all the elected officials who co-sponsored this event. Uh, we do this event every single year for the past six years. It's a tremendous partnership. It's only growing. And uh, now for the, the you, you've heard from all the folks who are going to be doing the work we need in Albany. Uh, now we'd like to hear from the advocates. Uh, and uh, a lot of the folks who you just heard from were advocates and continue to be advocates. Uh, but we're now going to get into the part of the program where uh, we can learn a little bit of, of what we came here for. So we're going to start with uh, tenants and neighbors. We're going to hear from uh, Zarina and Ali. Uh, and they're a group that works to organize tenants to preserve at-risk affordable housing and strengthen tenants' uh, rights in uh, the state of New York. If you can please uh, join me in welcoming them. Uh, ben, just quickly, we should also acknowledge that Councilwoman uh, Carlina Rivera was on. I think she had to jump off, but I want to acknowledge that she was with us earlier and thank her for our leadership in the city as well. Absolutely. And uh, now we will turn it over to tenants and neighbors. Hi, thank you for inviting me. I, my name is Allie Fishgrund. I am a tenant organizer with Tenants and Neighbors. Um, and I'm just going to speak briefly about the bill that was already mentioned by um, Senator Kavanaugh. Um, it is the Emergency Rent Relief Act of 2020. And um, basically, as he mentioned already, it will provide $100 million in rent arrears, which, as we all know, is not enough money. Um, and it has not yet been signed by the governor. Um, it will be administered by the state housing agency, DHCR. And which means we don't know exactly how it's going to work and they will be the ones who determine the details. Um, the bill would cover rent for tenants from April 1st to July 31st up to their rent burden prior to March 1st. So this means that if you previously paid 40% of your income towards rent, then you will pay 40% of your new income in rent once you receive the relief. Um, and in terms of who is eligible for coverage, um, tenants who are making 80% AMI or less, which is about $60,000 before March 7th and right now, so both time periods. Tenants who can prove that they have lost income between April 1st and July 31st of 2020 and tenants who were rent burdened before March 7th and are still rent burdened, meaning that they pay more than 30% of their income towards rent. So that was just a very brief overview of the bill um, and we hope that there will be more to come in order to help tenants through this difficult time. I'm now going to pass it over to my coworker, Zarina. Hello. Hi, thank you for inviting me. I'm Zarina with Tenants and Neighbors. I'm a tenant organizer, and I'm gonna talk about how we've been organizing remotely. Um, to, to the tenants, you know, you can still, you know, connect with your neighbors by sharing telephone numbers to talk about issues and concerns because you would need support from your neighbors. Um, you can still, you know, have your, your meetings, you know, by posting flyers in the buildings and have Zoom meetings and still organize your, your building. Um, we're also um, been having tenants on housing justice for all calls so they can share information on, with other tenants so tenants can organize together while at home. We know, you know, it's hard, you know, for people to come together to organize. If you want to have a tenant association, we can help you with the 
10 steps on how to organize your building. Um, I can share my information with you. So, you know, that's just a little bit on how, you know, we have been, you know, um, getting the tenants to organize in their buildings. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we're gonna turn over to Pilar de Jesus from Take Root Justice, uh, uh, who, you know, is uh, an amazing housing leader and can talk to us about kind of what their role is in this struggle. Pilar? Thank you. Thank you, Harvey, and thank you, Ben. Um, yes, my name is Pilar de Jesus. I'm one of the um, advocacy coordinators at Take for Justice, and I'm one of the um, um, coordinators on the Rent Justice Coalition, which is a coalition, um, a group of legal service providers, organizations, um, working with tenants, and many of the folks here on this call are part of the Rent Justice Coalition. Um, and I'm here to talk about the Rent Guidelines Board, um, the New York City Rent Guidelines Board. Um, and so the New York City Rent Guidelines Board um, is a board of nine members. So five public members, if folks don't know, and two members that represent the landlords and two members that represent the tenant's interest. And so this board is mandated to establish the rent adjustments for about over a million you know, rent stabilization apartments here in New York City. Um, the board holds annual series like public hearings where tenants come out and testify um, why um, they shouldn't receive an increase. That's most of what testimonies are. You know, this board is pretty much mandated or responsible for, um, you know, going over research, um, hearing testimonies from tenants, um, to determine what the the increase or decrease would be for rent stabilized tenants, and so our coalition, you know, for many years we've been fighting for a rent rollback. Um, we have been successful with two rent freezes a few years ago, as you may may have noticed. You know, the mayor likes to take a lot of credit for that, but that was due to the power of organizing and the tenants coming together and using their power, and so. We, especially now of COVID, the coalition, you know, originally we, we, we talked about how the board shouldn't have met at all because of everything going on and they should have initiated a freeze automatically. But now that they've moved forward and they are looking at data and they have looked at data, you know, based on what, you know, experts and experts that have testified, um, and what we see is that tenants are actually do a rent rollback, um, you know, at least the minimum, <laughs> you know, at least a 3% um, for a two year and 2% for one year. Um, but, you know, it seems like, because uh, many folks don't know, there's about a couple, so normally in a normal time, we have about five public hearings, one in each borough, and then we have a final vote we have a preliminary vote and then we have these hearings and then we have a final vote. This year, because due to COVID, things have moved fast. Um, they've shortened the, the number of, of public hearings. So uh, opposed to having five, this year they're only having two and those are taking place next week, um, June 10th and June 9th. But another issue we're having, you know, members and tenants and organizers are talking about is that it's very limited also. Unlike, you know, in the past, tenants, many tenants can come out and sign up to testify where this year they're limited in it. Um, it's done via YouTube and we're not allowed to make comments. There aren't any translation services available. Um, so we, we don't feel that, you know, the tenants' voices are being heard, but we are definitely encouraging people to sign up um, and you can sign up, but unfortunately right now <laughs> there is a waiting list um, and we still are encouraging tenants to sign up either way because um, how people are going to get on because there's uh, about 30 slots allotted for elected officials and agencies. So if those are not filled up, the folks who are waiting on this waiting list will then um, 
be added to able to testimony but you know i don't know about you guys tenants here that is just not right like i mentioned there are about maybe i think we're at two you know two million rent stabilization apartments so this is going to affect a lot of people and i think they limited the slots don't quote me on this i think to about 60 to 100 and anyone from the coalition remembers the actual number please let me share that but like that's nowhere near enough and that doesn't really cover the voices so what we as a coalition are doing the run justice coalition which take Rejustice justice as a part of um we are having our own people's forum next week on june 9th and so we definitely recommend and i will share this with harvey and um, ben and you guys can share it around but we're definitely encouraging people to sign up to testify because it doesn't seem like voices are going to be heard during their their public hearing the way it's going about it now so it's really important that we push the these this board to not only vote for a rent rollback, but if, if, if that's not the direction they're going because they've already had a preliminary vote and in that preliminary vote, they've determined that they will do for a one year lease renewal, they will be a, a zero increase. And for the two year, they would split it. And so like the first year you wouldn't get, um, a, it would be a zero increase, but the second year would be a 1% increase. And even though that that's like the lowest in RGB history, because the rent guidelines board has been known to provide some really high increases, especially in the, the during the Bloomberg time, that's just still too high. And as we all know, and as many of the electeds here are probably hearing from their constituents, even one dollar, even whatever, twenty dollars is going to be a lot for folks. And again, based on the data, the data actually shows rent rollback. And so, um, we encourage people. I'm going to send the links for folks to, to, to sign up, and to know it's going to be from four to eight p.m. Um, it's going to be live on Facebook on our Rent Justice Coalition page. But people should definitely sign up also for the rgb i was going to share that but i want to be respectful for people's time but you go to the right guideline board and you could um sign up there but again it's going to tell you you are going to be put on a waiting list um yeah i think that is about it and just continue to tell your elected officials you know ben kalos has always been, you know, our champion in the Red Justice Coalition. And when it comes to the rent guidelines, when he's been with us along with, you know, when Harvey was a tenant rep, like pushing for a rent rollback. And so, you know, you know, he, he's, or he doesn't need more encouraging, but we need to get the mayor and those board members on the same page on why there should be no increase for rent, for rent stabilizing. So it should be a rollback, but, um, uh, no increases especially now like i mentioned when i started in the beginning about the mental the mental health you know effects this is causing people i you know people especially our older seniors are very worried about money and people who lost their job they don't know like that that's just like another burden to put on them in my opinion and um, we could avoid that if we just do right by the tenants, at least in this level, because again, like my colleagues here are gonna talk about, it's also important to get that rent canceled. Thank you very much to Pilar, and we'd like to welcome our uh, next guest, uh, Kenny Schaefer, Chair of the Metropolitan Council on Housing, the nonprofit that serves more than a million New York City households that are rent stabilized or regulated particularly those who are most vulnerable to displacement, working class, and low-income New Yorkers. Please join me in welcoming uh, Kenny Schaefer. Hi. Uh, Kenny, you are still, you, I mistakenly- Yes. There we go. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, and I want to thank uh, Ben Kalos and Harvey Epstein for uh, pulling this together and all the other co-sponsors and participants uh, in this very important conversation tonight. Uh, usually, even when I'm talking about something serious, I like to throw in a few jokes, but uh, as Pilar said at the beginning of this meeting, this is not a time for jokes, given what's happening in the streets of New York and around the country, um, and our very democracy being under attack, as Senator Kruger said. Um, I've been, Met Council on Housing is uh, 
New York's oldest uh, tenants' rights organization. We just celebrated our 60th year, uh, still fighting strong uh, with a lot of allies now uh, across the city. Large and small groups have all joined the ever-growing movement to make housing as a human right a reality uh, and not just a slogan. Um, providing affordable housing to everybody would be a very expensive proposition, um, but there are ways to do that. Uh, taxing the billionaires is one way to do it, and cutting on the national level the bloated military budget. The United States military budget is larger than the next 10 countries combined. Uh, there's a lot of waste there. There's a lot of unnecessary uh, substitution of military might for diplomacy, uh, and it can be done if we keep fighting, and it will be done. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit uh, briefly about uh, the cancel rent movement and the rent strikes that are going on uh, throughout the state. And uh, if time allows to talk a little bit about the op opportunity for people to break leases given the situation, uh, but that may have to wait till the question period. So um, as several people have said, tens of millions of people around this country uh, can no longer afford their rent. People couldn't afford their rent even before the COVID crisis, but now people are out of work uh, either because of their illness or because their jobs have closed down uh, and they just can't afford the rent. So cancel rent is a national response uh, to this problem, um, to this health and economic crisis um, that has particularly affected low-income tenants of color, not just in New York City, but around the country. Um, we feel, and that council very much supports this movement with, again, lots and lots of allies, uh, that everyone's rents should be canceled uh, for the duration of this crisis and until the economy is back on a, a footing where people will be able to afford their rents. Uh, this should be categorical. People should not, there should not be a burden on tenants to come forward and ask for it uh, or to document uh, their economic losses. A lot of people cannot document their, their finances for various reasons, uh, which I'm sure everyone on this call uh, understands. Um, and the burden should be put on the real estate industry, which for years and decades uh, has reaped enormous profits. Uh, currently, according to the Rent Guidelines Board statistics, landlords are pocketing 39 and a half cents out of every, every rent dollar. Uh, and it's not just recently, the rents people are paying now are after 20 years of Bloomberg and Giuliani Rent Guidelines Board, as well as all the loopholes uh, that were closed last year in Albany, but before that happened, uh, cause rents to spiral and skyrocket to the point where most New Yorkers cannot afford their rents. Um, so we feel that rents should be canceled um, for tenants for the duration of this crisis and until things are back on an evil, even footing. Um, this is, again, it's a national movement. It's also a state movement. There's a lot of pressure on the governor uh, to do this. He's been very reluctant so far. He, acts, he said that he's already taken care of the problem by kicking the can down the road a few weeks. So evictions won't start again for a few weeks, but that's no real relief for New York City. Uh, it's not commensurate to what's needed. Um, so there's a big push today. Ithaca, the local government of Ithaca asked the state for permission to cancel their rents uh, as a health measure. They asked the New York State Health Commissioner, as I understand it, uh, to, can to allow them to cancel rents in Ithaca. And that's something that needs to be done across the state and across the country. Uh, very briefly, uh, there's also, I'm sure many, of, most of you have heard, there's a uh, rent strike movement um, for, for people that either can't afford their rent or people who can barely pay it, but shouldn't pay it because they can't feed their children. They, they can't, they've used up their savings. Uh, they can't afford other necessities, their utilities. Uh, so people are going on rent strike. It's a complicated issue. Uh, traditionally, rent strikes were a tool that Met Council was one of the leading pioneers of, where people usually facing lack of conditions and lack of repairs uh, or harassment would withhold their rent and put it aside uh, to get leverage against the landlord and to force them to negotiate. This is slightly different. It's an affirmative act of power by people to say the landlord doesn't deserve the rent we're not paying the rent. Uh, we're pushing, uh, again, to get the rent forgiven. We're hopeful that that will happen. 
Um, but people need to know that certainly there's a good chance that that's not going to happen and that people who are currently on rent strike are not paying their rent are going to have to face consequences for that. Uh, Alan Davidson's going to be talking later about what's going to be happening in housing court. Um, but, um, you know, people in that situation need to talk to lawyers to, to the extent that they can. Met Council has a hotline four days a week that people can call uh, and get good information and connect it to the right uh, referrals to get information about their rights and how to proceed. Um, but this is um, an important movement around the state uh, that people can uh, show their power and not to pay the rent. It's seven o'clock, so those of us that want to make a little noise can make a little noise. Um, We're actually going to unmute for about one minute and let everyone uh, go, go nuts. Okay, everyone, you can unmute yourselves. Okay, just to wrap up, I was asked to say a few words about people that want to break their lease. I'm just going to say very quickly, uh, there are people who signed leases that can no longer move in or afford the apartments, and there are other people who's, who are in the middle of a lease and can no longer afford their rents and they want to break their lease. That's a complicated legal issue. Um, we're not sure how the courts are going to respond uh, when people make these arguments. So again, uh, you know, get legal advice, get legal information about what your rights are. Again, Met Council has a hotline and a lot of other people, all the elected officials have excellent staff that can also help you answer these questions. And maybe there'll be time for more discussion during the question period. But thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Kenny. And it was almost like you were trying to allow me to talk about my bill, which allows tenants to break their leases early uh, uh, during this time. So uh, we can, we'll put Rebecca or someone in my office will put in the chat the bill number and hopefully everyone can go out and co-sponsor and support that bill. Uh, but now we're going to turn it over to Rebecca Goodman from NIMIC. I'm so used to calling it Northern Manhattan, but we don't do it anymore. The Northern Manhattan the folks there have been such an ally in the tenants' rights movement. And they've really been on the forefront of issues in, in Manhattan and now in the Bronx for, for decades. And it's really amazing leadership. And, we're gonna, and she's going to talk about harassment and emergency repairs, as well as kind of one-shot deals. Thank you for joining us and welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Sorry, I was having trouble getting myself unmuted. Um, yes, my name is Beck Goodman. I use she, her pronouns. I'm here with NIMIC today. We work in uh, the Bronx, Washington Heights, and Morningside Heights. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about some general um, tenants' rights issues that we see common, commonly. These are not specific to COVID-19. They were all the rights that you had prior to the crisis and the rights that you'll continue to have afterwards. Um, if it's convenient, I have a PowerPoint if you want to put it up, if you don't want to. Oh, there we go. Perfect. <laughs> um, so we can go ahead and just look at slide two. For folks who don't know, there are multiple different types of housing available in New York. I'm going to spend the bulk of my time talking about rent regulated housing, and that is either that you're rent stabilized or rent controlled. Uh, that is determined based on not who you are as a tenant, but the type of building that you live in. And both types of housing come with certain uh, rules. You go ahead on to the third slide, thanks. Um, so we're all familiar with leases, and you'll hear uh, a little bit later on, I think specifically about what leases look like now in terms of 
COVID-19, but leases are just a contract between you and your property owner. Um, if you are a rent stabilized tenant, uh, and you know that because it will say it on your lease, uh, you are entitled automatically to a re, uh, lease renewal based on the previous terms of your lease. So I saw some questions about when you could get your lease or how changes could happen to your lease. You're, if you're rent stabilized, you're automatically guaranteed the rights of your previous lease. That's one of the things that comes with rent stabilization. We can move on to the fourth slide um, about paying rent. Obviously paying rent right now during the COVID-19 crisis again, is slightly different than what we're seeing because of the various eviction moratoriums that you're gonna be hearing about a little bit later. Um, but Pilar uh, spoke earlier about the Rent Guidelines Board. Again, that's specifically for rent stabilized tenants. Um, all tenants though are entitled to um, receipts from rent. And if you're not receiving receipts from your property owner, that's something to really ask for because that's documentation that you have a zero balance and of your payment history. I also saw some questions about SCREE and DRE, um, so I'll attempt to quickly answer them now. But SCREE is citizen, a senior citizen rent increase exemption. DRE is for folks with disability rent increase uh, exemption. If there's an increase to your rent, the SCREE and DRE programs cover that increase, so you should not see an increase into any um, rent that you're paying out of pocket. We can move on to the next slide just for the sake of time. Um, here are a couple of basic rights that all tenants, regardless of what type of housing unit you live in, you're entitled to. One is called the warranty of habitability, and that means that you're entitled to live in a, um, an apartment that is habitable, that is safe. Specifically, I want to highlight that that includes um, heat and hot water, things that we often see within our populations are denied to tenants. Right now, those are considered emergency repairs. So you can go ahead and call 311, that number will be uh, appear later. And that is something that someone will come out to your building from HPD, which is a citywide agency. They'll come out to your building, um, inspect it, and then they can apply pressure to the property owner and, and mandate that they make that emergency repair. Also, I really wanna briefly touch upon um, succession rights. This is specifically for rent regulated apartments, so that's rent stabilized or rent controlled. Succession rights means that someone who is a leaseholder, they hold the rights to that apartment being rent regulated. If that person permanently vacates or unfortunately passes away, a family like member who has been living in that apartment for typically over two years is entitled to take over that lease with all of the rights and you know rent level and everything that came previously um, on it. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. Uh, just a quick note about things that your landlord can and cannot do. Um, no property owner can mandate or control the number of folks you have living in your apartment, unless that is um, a violation of the certificate of occupancy, meaning that the city has determined that that is an unsafe um, or inappropriate number of people living in that apartment. But they cannot just tell you someone cannot live with you. And the other thing to highlight, um, and I have a feeling we will be seeing quite a bit of as the, uh, the all-encompassing eviction moratorium comes up in the coming days, is that no property owner can retaliate against you for taking any type of action against them or harass you. Harassment can look a lot of different ways. It's a very broad term for an important reason in that it is um, a tool that property owners often use by doing things like refusing to make mandatory repairs on your apartment, putting video cameras up uh, outside of your apartment door, or um, creating illegal lockouts by just changing the locks on your apartment door. That's an illegal um, eviction, it can. And uh, the last thing I'll say is that you always have the right to organize a TA within your building. That's a tenant association of other, um, of your neighbors to you know, make your position stronger. You always have the right to withhold rent. We'll be hearing a little bit more about the rent strike later, I believe. And if you're a rent stabilized um, tenant, you always can speak to DHCR, which is the statewide agency that's in uh, control of state uh, stabilized apartment units. And our last slide is just some actions that you can take if you see any issues in your building. So we can look at the last slide and then I will head out. 
Again, you can always call 311 to report any conditions. Sending letters to landlords um, and property management companies creates a really strong paper trail in case any of your actions need to be um, taken up in court. Um, and then the following listed below are more legal uh, strategies. And again, um, lastly, the rent strike, which I think we'll be hearing a little bit more about. Thank you very much for having me. And I hope I can answer some more of your questions later on in the night. This is our uh, last speaker before we dig into approximately uh, 30 or 40 questions that we got just from folks like you who submitted them with their RSVP or over Facebook or Twitter. Uh, next, we'll hear from Lenox Hill Neighborhood House, an organization that provides free legal services to thousands of seniors, disabled, and homebound adults and low-income families each year, which directly help our community members remain secure and stable in their homes. Please welcome, join me in welcoming uh, Ashley, a uh, housing attorney at Lenox Hill Neighborhood House. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ashley Virouette. I am a housing attorney, as mentioned, at Lenox Hill Neighborhood House. I wanted to touch briefly on ways that tenants can actually get in touch with lawyers right now. Uh, normally, a lot of organizations, my own included, would actually have the ability for you to come in, to call our offices, to talk to us in the housing court, and all of those avenues are shut down right now. Um, so there's a few ways that you can access attorneys right now um, to talk about kind of all of these things that have already been mentioned, you know, rent strike, how that might impact you, your inability to pay, any really specific question about your housing situation. Um, so the first way that you can get in touch with, a, with an attorney is actually by calling 311. So 311 was, act, was already mentioned. Um, they have a tenant helpline, which will connect you with attorneys who would normally be working in housing court. So there's a number of or organizations um, that assist tenants in housing court, low income tenants specifically. Um, so by calling 311 and telling them you wanna talk to a lawyer or you need a tenant you know, helpline, they can connect you to whatever organization is kind of manning the hotline that day. Uh, you can also email civiljustice at hra.nyc.gov, which I believe is in, I tried to put it in the chat or have the operator send to the chat. Um, and this hotline for HRA is Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So if you call, they will connect you. Uh, you can also get in touch with lawyers via Housing Court Answers. Housing Court Answers also has um, a tenant hotline that runs 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. Uh, the number is also in the chat, but I'll repeat it. It's 212-962-4795. Um, Housing Court Answers specifically can answer questions about court procedure, you know, landlord and tenant rules and regulations, uh, enforcing housing code violations, and they can also provide referrals to free legal uh, assistance, as well as other community-based organizations who might be able to help you with your issue. Finally, the last um, resource I want to mention is a actually a website called justfix.nyc. Um, so they have quite a few products and services that you can access on their website. If you, there'll be like a little search bar right at the top, you can put in your address and it will list all the things that you can do. Um, for example, you can get their assistance online with sending your landlord a letter about repairs. You can do research on your property owner to figure out, you know, what other properties do they own? How many violations are in your building? You know, different pieces of information about that property owner, about your building and other properties that they own. Um, you can also request a rent history uh, this is something specifically for tenants who are rent stabilized. You can look at the history of your rent. Um, it might be something you want to go through with an attorney, but if you request this document and you see like a really crazy jump in the rent, you know, something could be going on there and maybe you want to contact a lawyer about that. Um, the last thing that I think Just Fix is really wonderful for is filing HP actions. And these are uh, actions that the housing court is currently permitting. And it is where a tenant actually sues their landlord 
over either repair issues that are really emergent. Right now they're looking at emergency repairs, but you could, in, normally you would be able to do it for any repair, but right now they're really focusing on emergency repairs um, or for harassment. So if you feel like your landlord is harassing you and you feel like you wanna take some action against them, you could do that in housing court. And Just Fix actually has in their web browser a way for you to click through you know, check boxes basically and fill out a little bit of information and they will compile that into a legal document and send it to the courthouse. And then the court will take that legal document and send it to a lawyer who will get in touch with you and will help you with that action. Um, so as I mentioned, it's all in the chat. It's a lot of information, but we just wanted to make sure that you guys knew how to actually contact someone to address all these issues that we've been discussing um, today. Thank you so much. And to our final panelist, Ellen Davidson. Well, Ellen has been a fighter at Legal Aid on tenant issues for a few years now, let's just say. And she's been a real vocal supporter of tenants all over New York City. Ellen, thank you for your advice and your leadership and, you know, and talking us through what's going on with the moratorium and what people should know and what not to know and what, how how's it going to function in, these new, in this new time. Um, hey, thanks. Uh, so, um, uh, what I learned today is that the plural of moratorium is moratoria. Um, and the reason I mentioned that is that there are multiple ones which make everything massively confusing. You've heard the date July 20th, uh, sorry, June 20th. That's the date that the governor said no cases can go forward until June 20th, 21st, um, really the 22nd because it's a Monday. Um, we believe that there will be no fi new filings of cases until uh, June 22nd. Um, I put a lot of we believe um, because if you are confused about what's going on with housing court, you are not alone. Every single communication, either coming from the governor or the courts, just makes more confusion and creates more stress for everyone involved, um, honestly, including the landlord attorneys. Um, but it's a disaster. Um, so, but at the moment, all cases are on pause. If you had a case that began before uh, housing court closed, um, your case shouldn't be going forward. The only cases that should be going forward right now are either emergencies, which have to do with emergency repairs or illegal lockouts, and some cases that are going forward when there are two attorneys on both sides. Um, so that's until that's what we have until June 20th. Then on top of that, the governor announced that there would be an, another moratorium that would last in, for 60 days until August 20th. Um, and everyone was all excited. And then it turned out that he w didn't want you to understand what the fine print was, which was that that was only for people who are either on un unemployment insurance benefits or can show a COVID related financial hardship. Um, and are involved with a non-payment. So if you live in a building that is unregulated and you haven't paid rent and your landlord has decided to not renew your lease, you are not covered by the new moratorium that the governor did until August 20th. That is why we need good cause eviction as part of any solution uh, to both this crisis as well as uh, to protect tenants throughout the state uh, just now. Um, if you... Uh, qualify for this new moratorium, meaning you're on unemployment insurance benefits or you uh, have received a, a COVID-related financial hardship, we are recommending that people write to their landlords and tell them that. Your landlord will then try to get information from you to prove it. Do not give them the information. They have no right to that information. Um, so that's the state moratorium, uh, moratorium, moratoria. Um, there's one more moratorium, which is as part of the CARES Act, there's a federal moratorium for certain types of building and certain types of tenants. So if you live in public housing, any project-based Section 8, you have a Section 8 voucher. You live in a 202 or 811 building. If you live in a low-income housing tax credit building, or if you live in a building with multifamily uh, more, has a mortgage backed by either Freddie, May, Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae, 
Um, your landlord cannot bring a case for rent or late fees through uh, July 25th. And if he wants to then bring a non-payment case against you, he has to give you 30 days notice. Now, most tenants don't realize that they live in a building with a mortgage uh, backed by either Freddie or Fannie. Um, the National Low Income Housing Coalition has a database that allows you to look up your building to find out if you qualify for this. And if you qualify under the federal moratorium, the landlord can't bring a case against you. It's illegal for him to do so. Um, so uh, that's basically what's going on with housing court. Um, and tomorrow everything may change. Uh, just because these are all based on administrative orders and executive orders, and we have the Senator Hoyleman's bill, which hasn't been signed by the by the governor yet, but may come into play as well. Um, so um, I know that all of your elected officials are pushing out information so you understand um, and understand what's going on. Also, calling 311 and looking to get legal advice. All of the legal services providers, we are not in our offices but we are on call to help people and answer questions. Um, so please, please ask. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ellen. And thank you for that word of advice about tenants and writing to the landlord if they have COVID related issues. I think it's really important to tenants know that if they have concerns because they have uh, lost income up because of COVID or additional expenses because of COVID, Putting in a writing is a really important first step for all tenants to take, so thank you. So just questions, uh, uh, besides writing to the landlord, are there recommendations that you or other the panelists have that tenants should be doing to, to, to deal with the situation? Are there, are there other solutions? You know, that we met, someone mentioned, and Brian mentioned the state law that passed a couple of weeks ago about potential money available. How do tenants know how to navigate the system? And that's really to any of the panelists. Well, I just want to jump in. Uh, the most imp one of the most important things people can do is to talk to their neighbors um, and, and form a tenant association. If there isn't one already, share information, support each other, um, and Met Council, as well as the other organizations in this panel can, can help with that. Um, I would also say that um, we know that there's a potential for there to be one more bill coming from the federal government to provide money um, in to the state. Um, there was a mention of the fact that House of Representatives passed a three trillion dollar a bill that included some good things for tenants, including, by the way, new Section 8 vouchers, which would be immensely important for New York City, especially um, because uh, cancel rent is immensely important, but it actually doesn't address our unhoused uh, neighbors um, who uh, need help getting into permanent housing because as we know, healthcare, um, housing is healthcare in this time of this crisis. Um, so please, I, I know that the House of Representatives did pass the bill, but it was an opening negotiating stance. There's a lot of stuff in that bill and things are gonna fall off the table as they start negotiating with Republicans for what stays in the bill. Um, and so the more that you can reach out to your federal elected officials to make sure that they understand that it is an absolute priority that we get money into the city. It also includes public housing operating um, expenses that are desperately, desperately needed. Please, please call your federal elected officials. Please, if you have family members in other states, have them call federal elected officials. But we must have a drum beat to our federal elected officials that we need the money that is in um, the, uh, the HEROES Act for tenants. Um, and uh, we need to uh, not forget um, our unhoused, unhoused New Yorkers who need help getting into permanent housing. Thank you, uh, Ben, to the next, for the next question. Uh, so we have a question. My landlord tried to evict me from my rent-stabilized apartment on a false claim 
and lost. Now he wants to raise my rent based on the cost for roof repairs he made to the building. He was denied this rent increase by the Division of Housing, but I received the letter this week. He is contesting the denial. I have 20 days to reply to the letter I was sent. How should I reply to protect my rent stabilized apartment? Well, one thing is I heard yesterday that DHCR has extended the deadline uh, just when it was about to expire. So these deadlines have, have been expanded. Ellen may have exact more precise information, but they should definitely respond. Um, Ellen, I don't know if someone else wants to give a little more details on that. I mean, I, I, I think what I would start out with is the thing about major capital improvements is it's a building wide expense. Um, so you are not alone in fighting against this major capital improvement. Um, so please get in contact with your neighbors who are probably also getting this notice and wanting to fight back. Um, uh, if, uh, if, in fact, you are the only rent stabilized apartment in your building, uh, then I have good news for you because part of the bill that got passed last year said if the building had uh, less than 35% of the units being uh, rent stabilized, uh, the landlord couldn't get a MCI anymore. Um, but to the extent your neighbors are also fighting this MCI, this is the time to uh, put up a flyer um, and uh, you know put up your number and have people call you so you can start organizing to respond to this together. It's a good sign they denied them and now he's appealing um, because it's, it looks like HCR agrees that this isn't something that your landlord is entitled to. Um, but uh, you're always better fighting with your neighbors. Uh, you know, uh, not fighting with your neighbors, but working together with your neighbors. Uh, more, against the more power in numbers. You know, it's really important to build that base with your te your your neighbors and build that that organization, especially um, in something like this, or even with repairs. You know, um, we talked about filing HPs, but you know, it's definitely not a fun thing to go through, but something that we all encourage is to, to do group, group actions. It's, you know, again, um, just more powerful. Also, some of these issues about what's a proper MCI and what's not are technical legal issues. So to the extent that you can reach out and get legal representation and advice, that's also certainly advisable. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Uh, another question is, how can we make landlords pay for gas, water, heating, oil, electric, and internet? Any of the panelists to kind of shift the burden to landlords that are now burdened by tenants? Get your elected official to write a bill. <laughs> uh, I don't have a... a an answer for that one. Yeah, so I guess it's more like a legislative solution because right now they can, you know, everything else is separately. So unless we take over utilities and have a public utility system um, and have free free Wi-Fi across New York City, um, yeah. it's a heavy lift. I was going to say some of these things could be addressed by the city for you, city council members. Uh, who are part of this, the housing maintenance code of the city does require like heat and hot water and things like that. And possibly some of that could be ex extended. I, I've been in buildings where I did not have a separate heat bill, but I've also been advised by experts on this call that they just built it into my rent and what have you. Uh, and in terms of internet, uh, if you are on, if you have a child in the house who is on free and reduced school lunch, they are eligible, or you have a senior in your home and they are, are eligible for a supplemental social security income, and you do not currently have broadband, uh, something that I was able to negotiate uh, is something called internet essentials through either Spectrum or Altice or any of the new vendors that will give you broadband for $14.99 a month. Uh, so uh, that is something, but uh, as we look at re renewing our franchise agreements in the city of New York, one of the things I've been pushing for is to provide free municipal uh, broadband to NYCHA residents and uh, also possibly taking back the broadband and having a municipal broadband program. I also go to the next question. 
Uh, I, I actually live in Rupert, Yorkville, so I will share that. That is my daughter in the background. Uh, it is, we are past bedtime. She's been sneaking out. Uh, you might hear her pitter patter and this is the new normal. Uh, so this is from one of my neighbors. I've been a tenant in good standing at Rupert Yorkville condominium complex for 30 years. What rules does my rental apartment fall under? What are the protections against tenant eviction? Who can a tenant in this complex go to for grievances? or for rental protection, I will just start with saying you can call my office 212-860-1950. I also know your TA leader is Rita Popper, and I know that a lot of you should be on uh, uh, sticky, section eight sticky vouchers, but that being said, I know a handful of the folks on this call have been involved in a lot of the fights. I'm not sure if anybody else wants to jump in on that or that's, we're good with Ben's answer, but no, I'll just move on to like a Wait, landlord before question. Before you move along, uh, we've been joined by an elected official who, who needs no introduction. Uh, sh when they tried to downsize tenants in Rupert Yorkville condominium from, uh, I think they're trying to downsize parents and children from two bedrooms down to studios, uh, Gail Brewer was there uh to fight and win and stop the downsizing along with a lot of the people on this call she has been fighting uh the rent guidelines board for rent freezes and low increases every year year in year out she is always there the pandemic didn't stop her every day on twitter she's out there with food and masks uh and uh, she even gives out her mobile number if you need help uh please welcome join me in welcoming our borough president uh, gail brewer hey hey gail Yeah, we... I'm here. I'm... Yeah, I got it. Thank you very much. I don't want to interrupt. Keep going with your questions. Um, I think the topic that you're, we're, we're also, um, it, it, it's a very, you know, I don't want to talk about challenging times because everybody knows that between health, economic development, and all, all the issues that we are facing in terms of racial inequality in our face. It's a hard time. I just came off an arts call. It's very exciting. That's what's inspirational. We have 300 arts groups talking about how they could be part of the opening. And that's when you feel like there's hope. I feel very uh, like we really are going to have to stick together. Is there a new normal on housing? That would be a nice no to know. Is there a different way of approaching it? So that's why you're all here. I'll listen. I'm glad to listen to whatever in the next few minutes or time. But I just want, I want to say thank you, Ben Kalos, and certainly Harvey Epstein and everybody who's on this call. It's uh, listening for me because I think I can't handle anything else right now. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, we thank you, Gail, for all you do for our borough and our, and our city. I, and the I and everyone else here appreciates uh, you being such a fabulous leader for our, our borough. Thank you. But, so there's a question from a landlord about how small property owners are going to pay for their taxes if they're not getting any rent from their tenants. So I'm not sure who wants to take that. I'll start and then I'll let other people take it. I mean, legislation that we are talking about are, is how, making sure that we have small property owner funds available to make sure that no one gets foreclosed on. We have a, not just an eviction moratorium, but a foreclosure moratorium. We have city and state dollars that are available to small property owners all over New York to ensure that they maintain their home. If there's someone's in the city of New York, they should reach out to HPD. There are low interest loans or potentially grants available for small property owners. We're talking about real estate tax forgiveness. And the cancel rent bill, which we talked a lot about, is, has a specific provision that allows uh, small property owners to get money if there's a uh, specifically with hardship. So there's a lot of things in the cancer rent movement that really want to protect small property owners. We don't want more private equity or predatory landlords to come in and take over real estate in New York City. And I know myself and all my colleagues in Albany are going to fight to ensure that there is resources available for small property owners. I'm not sure anybody else on the panel wants to add to that. I mean, Others? the only thing I would say is that I know a lot of landlord groups are reaching out to their federal elected officials about making sure that whatever next step Congress takes, it includes money for housing. And so if it's something that is important to you, you might want to reach out to your federal elected. 
And I just want to say, I mean, big picture, I agree with you know, what Harvey said and, and the, the remedies that small landlords can get. <clears throat> but big picture, Met Council doesn't believe housing should be a commodity. We don't think it should be a business investment where people can extract profits from people's housing. So to the extent that small landlords don't feel they can make a, a, a sufficient profit by providing housing to low income people, then let, them, let, let those become public housing without a profit being taken out of the rent roll. That's not what they want to hear, but you know, big picture, you know, I think that's where we talk about social housing and expanding public housing and tenant ownership and other forms of nonprofit ownership. Uh, and that's part of the solution. You know, if, if landlords can't make a profit off the backs of low income people, okay, fine, get a real job. Uh, we've uh, been joined by our council member from the Lower East Side, a former housing organizer herself at good old Lower East Side. Uh, she's been incredibly active in the council. She's co-chaired the Women's Caucus. She's currently co-chair of the uh, Census uh, Committee, and uh, she will tell us a little bit about the Census. And uh, if you can uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Carlina Rivera. Thanks everyone. I will be brief because I know you heard from a lot of electeds today. And um, we really are going to keep fighting for our tenants. I want to just say a quick thing about housing. Yes, I used to work at good old Lower East Side proudly. It is what really um, brought me into the organizing world and doing social services and going with people to housing court, even just for emotional support, going with a senior who speaks English as a second language who cannot quite get an attorney and just needs to get, you know, an adjournment or just really helping people understand uh, their rights when they're getting harassed by their landlord who threatens them with calling ICE. So I've seen a lot of different kinds of cases, some very tragic and sad, and then of course some that are inspiring and uplifting. And I do it all with you um, who have gotten us rent freezes and, and save buildings and organized tenant associations. And so we need all that money to keep funding your work. And that's where the census comes in. You know, it's 10 minutes. It's the next 10 years of our city. And it is pretty much determines our future. It's America's story. It funds the section eight that I grew up in, uh, the, the SNAP program that some of your clients and your organizers and, and tenants rely on and a whole host of other things that I think lead to real justice, which is that everyone has equal access to housing, education, food, and healthcare. So I'm um, really happy to be there. I'm sorry I was kind of like in and out. I heard from all my elected colleagues who are trying to do their best. I was at a small business town hall. As you know, they're also going through it and it's all related, but uh, housing is healthcare. I stand by that statement always. And I just want to thank you all for the work that you do. And to Council Member Kalos for organizing. Very cool. Thanks, everyone. And equal credit to Harvey Epstein and uh, all the folks who've been involved. I just want to answer to the landlord question before we go to a second landlord question, which is just, uh, I wrote an op-ed with uh, economist Teresa Garaducci after the federal government gave a bailout to banks as soon as the coronavirus crisis happened, where they actually started making interest zero for the, for the banks, for FHA loans and, and what have you. And so the idea was if the bank takes the money, they would have to pass it on uh, to anyone who, is, who had a mortgage. Uh, sorry, if a bank took the money, they would have to allow landlords not to pay their mortgages. And if a, if a landlord took that benefit, they would have to pass that on to their tenants. And in that way, uh, pass it down because right now we still have this Reaganomics of a uh, uh, trickle down economy where they just bail out the banks, they bail out big business and they left everyone who's undocumented out in the out, out to dry. Uh, they left anyone else who, who didn't have W2 income out to dry. They've left so many tenants and, and what have you. So uh, there's a lot out there. There's a lot of protections for landlords. The next question from a landlord is how long do you feel it is fair to allow tenants who weren't paying landlords prior to COVID shutdown and who continue not to pay to stay in an apartment? Um, and I'll just give a quick answer before I pass on to anyone else. We had a housing crisis before now. We have a homelessness crisis currently. And uh, with I think one in 10 Americans or possibly two in 10 Americans currently unemployed, 
I, I, if, if I were a landlord, I would not be in a rush to evict anyone because I'm not sure you're gonna find new tenants to find those slots. So I think the coronavirus, if, it, if anyone has learned anything, I'm hoping all of us, including landlords, have learned that we are all in this together. And uh, now is not the time to seek to evict. Now is the time to work with the city to uh, take advantage. And if, if you, you heard from Kenny Schaefer, you heard from other folks, uh, we've got money in the city. We're not bankrupt yet. And uh, we have programs for affordable housing. So if you've got tenants who are rent striking because they can't, some people are rent striking because they believe it. A lot of people are rent striking because they literally just don't have money anymore. Uh, so if you're in that situation and you're having trouble meeting uh, the requirements to maintain your building, let me know, let our panelists know, we're happy to work with you uh, to get you the assistance that you need, uh, whether it's capital investment and assistance from HPD or what have you in exchange for making your housing affordable. I'll turn it over to anyone else who wants to speak to that and then we'll get back to more tenant questions. Just real quickly, uh, Steve Banks, the uh, commissioner of HRA has made it very clear that the city is going to be as generous as it can be uh, to give rent arrears grants to people once things start up again. And a lot of tenants are going to be able to get rent assistance and the landlords, of course, will be the beneficiaries of that. Uh, it may take a while because there's going to be tens of thousands of people in that situation, but that pipeline will be there. Thank you. Uh, and I'll just offer one up piece up and just so you know, I've had a bill in Albany to increase revenue, not just for New York State, but for New York City to allow New York City to tax millionaires and billionaires at a higher level right now. You can make a half million or a hundred million and you only pay 3.34% of your income towards tax. And why shouldn't we graduate it? We believe in progressive taxation. We could do that for New York City and get New York City out of this budget hole right now with the 118 billionaires up from 112 billionaire just in March. We have more billionaires in New York City now than we had before during a global pandemic. So clearly they have more money and they can do more with their money to help all of the rest of us. But um, going back. Sorry. Going back to, the, to our question, and sorry about my statement there, but um, how do I get, how do I receive my new lease from uh, Rent Stabler's apartment? My lease expired in March and I haven't received my new renewal lease. So any of the panelists, maybe some of the panelists haven't spoken as much, we'd love to hear from you. I mean, I can try to address that. I, I would say, you know, try to contact your management. Obviously they should have sent you the lease already. They're supposed to send you the lease it expires you are as a rent stabilized tenant entitled to that lease um if you're not able to get in touch with management i think this is a great situation in which you should reach out you know via 311 or via housing court answers and get an attorney because i know for example my organization does write what we call demand letters which are letters that we send landlords demanding that they do the things that they're supposed to do in this situation that would be providing you with your lease um, so if they're not giving you that document if you to them and they're just ignoring you or refusing or not responsive, I would say this is a great time to take advantage of your legal resources and, and contact a lawyer and see what assistance you in, in drafting that letter and sending that letter demanding that you get the lease that you're entitled to. The, the only other thing I would say um, is that to the extent you can't get an attorney, um, there is a very easy form that you can file with DHCR about not getting your lease on time. The other thing you should know as an unstabilized tenant is that if your landlord doesn't provide your lease between 90 and 150 days prior to your lease's expiration, they then have to, they can't increase your rent until they've given you those 90 days notice. Um, so if your landlord gives you the lease renewal late, you have 90 days before your new, your increase goes into effect. Yeah, you're safe from eviction and the landlord can't raise your rent. It, but people like the security of the lease. So that's why, as Alan said, there's a form you can fill out, failure to renew. Thank you. Next question, I am a rent, the, the question is from somebody who is a rent stabilized tenant currently subletting their apartment. The allowed two years ended in April 15th, but my tenant, because of the coronavirus, has been unable to find himself an apartment, and I have another place to stay. How long can my tenant count on staying? My landlord agreed to the two years, and then a two-month extension. He has not agreed to any additional time. 
I mean, so this is a very practical answer. I mean, you at this moment can't evict your client, your subtenant, even if you wanted to. Um, so I think that if the landlord went to punish you because you weren't able to evict your uh, subtenant at a moment in which housing courts were closed, that uh, a court wouldn't listen to your landlord. But it's true, you're only allowed to sublet your apartment for two years. Um, so you need to have a conversation with your subletter uh, so that you don't end up uh, uh, in, any, in any danger. And you may want to create a paper trail by writing a letter to the subtenant. And then if the landlord ever sued you, the courts would be pretty understanding. But if, you know, the more you could show that you were a victim of circumstances, the lighter it would be on you. And a lot of these are constituent service individual issues that we are just asking just in case other people are facing similar challenges. Uh, but if you reach out to me, uh, bkalos at benkalos.com or Harvey Epstein, help.district74 at gmail.com or any of the elected officials that you see here today from Gail Brewer to Carlina Rivera, whoever represents you, uh, we can work with you. We can try to see if we can find somebody who you uh, may qualify for because of your income status like legal aid or other groups that are willing to work with you uh, on our behalf. So uh, don't, don't feel like you have to ask your question here. And if you still need more assistance, feel free to reach out and we'll try to get you additional assistance. So the next question is from a tenant who's been a rent stabilized tenant for 12 years. And this year the landlord told me they had to uh, reapply for a new lease for their present apartment. What should this tenant do? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Harvey. I, I missed what the landlord was doing. He's requiring that the tenant uh, reapply for a new lease for their for their current rent stabilized apartment. That's ridiculous. That's not allowed. You have a right to a renewal lease on the same terms and conditions as your original lease. Um, and that's the landlord hoping he's going to catch you and you don't know your rights and you should know your rights. You've just heard it here. Thank you, Ellen. This is for uh, Kenny Schaffer at Met Council. Is it legal to raise rents every year on a one-year lease? Can NYCHA evict if someone has never been a problem tenant and rent has always been paid on time? So I'm assuming the question has to do with the NYCHA tenant in terms of raising the rent. So NYCHA and other public forms of public housing are often based on income. Uh, and you have to recertify your income every year if your income goes up and you're paying 30% of your income as rent, then your rent will go up. If your income goes down, which will happen for a lot of people, then you're entitled to have your rent go down. And in fact, even though there's annual recertifications, people can ask for an interim recertification when their income goes down. As far as the other part of the question, uh, NYCHA as a government agency has to follow due process. They cannot evict anybody uh, without uh, just cause. Um, that was my clinic in law school a million years ago was uh, NYCHA termination proceedings. And the Escalera case said that NYCHA and all other government affected housing, even landlords that have contracts with the government can only evict for good cause. So no, they cannot evict you if you haven't done anything wrong. Uh, next question is for Pilar on, on the rank guidelines board. How much rent increase can I expect on a two-year lease going forward? Qual tenants to qualify for SCREE and their rent stabilized. Sorry. Um, so, so right now, I mean, when I don't know if the person means moving forward. Right now, um, if anyone is renewing a lease from right now up until September 30th. Um, your rent increase would apply for the percentage that took place at the RGB hearing last year, which I believe it was 1.5% for one year and 2.5% for two years. So if you're signing the lease though after um, September 30th, October 1st this year, we don't know what the percentage is going to be yet. The rent guidelines board right now has just put a preliminary vote out. We still have hearings, as I mentioned, to, that are taking place next week. And then the final vote where, on June 17th, where they will determine what the percentage will be for um, lease renewal leases starting from October 1st, 2020 
till um, September 30th, 2021. So it depends really where in this year you're assigning the lease to determine what your increase would be. And what happens if no one from this town hall shows up and speaks out about a rent freeze and even advocating for a rollback? What happens if everyone just stays home? then you're more than likely it looks like right now there will be a rent increase if you sign for a two year that's just what the proposal is but you have to come out and tell them why you should not have a rent increase it's going to be really especially important this year uh, what advice can you give residents that are doing personal rent strikes due to lack of repairs during this pandemic Document, document, document. Withhold the rent and put it aside to the extent that you can. Yeah, but to the extent you're not getting repairs, like document everything that's wrong with the apartment. Keep the rent, yes, keep the rent aside. Um, when you have everything you owe your landlord and you're, and you're complaining about repairs, the power is in your hands, right? Yeah. Your power is in your hands, so. Yeah. And work with your neighbors. Yeah. Call 311, which is part of the documentation, to get HPD out there to inspect. And, you know, as we've mentioned, you can file an emergency HP. Um, that's something my office has been doing at Take Root Justice these days. Um, but document is always important and or start organizing because if more than likely, if you're having these individual repair issues, there's probably other tenants having the same issue and then who knows what the mm -hmm. building wide issues are. One thing yeah. that's really important is to take photographs because eventually the landlord may come up and fix it the day before you go in front of a judge. And if you have photographs, the, you know, the, yeah. Yeah, use the Just Fix website too to, to capture that information. It's again, documentation to build your case. And so documentation, it's pictures, 301 emails, any, are those the big three or are there any other key pieces of documentation folks should think about making? Notice to the landlord, certainly, you know, a letter to the landlord, send certified if you can, or if not, or an email, something you have a paper trail. Yeah. So they can't say they didn't know. Oh, we didn't know. As soon as we found out, we fixed it. Yeah. Something I also recommend to some of my clients is to keep a log um, because this say it ever makes it to trial, you know, a case where the, you know, just, it's just good to keep notes. Like, well, on June 4th at 555, I called the landlord to tell him and he said, you know, just to note, just so you have that information. So it's part of the and document. If, and if the case ever goes to a trial, those notes could be, you could look at them when you're testifying to refresh your recollection while you're testifying. Because, you know, six months later, you might not remember the details. Great. Uh, so uh, my, I think will be my final question. I think um, then I'll have one after mine would be the pandemic unemployment insurance runs out July 34, stage four reopening in New York is not likely to begin until after that. How are we as tenants going to be able to pay our rent? Unless the federal government comes through with the money that they have in the HEROES Act, I don't know that tenants are going to. I think that's why we're so um, so uh, desperate um, and so much there's so much worry um, because uh, without um, w there is no plan and uh, we're hearing that the federal government does not intend to continue the pandemic unemployment because it was so useful to people uh, the Republicans in Congress don't want to support. Um, helping people more. Absolutely. If someone does go to work a couple months afterwards, by the time the case goes to court, if they're back at work and can afford their current rent, they'll be eligible in many cases to get a one-shot rent grant from HRA and from various charities if they can afford the rent going forward. I want to thank Assemblymember Harvey Epstein. I want to let folks know if you're on the call and you haven't had a chance to answer your your, ask your question, just raise your hand. We will get to you towards the end. At this point, we're just trying to get through the folks who did submit their questions uh, with their RSVPs. Uh, we have about uh, five or so left before we start getting to some of the folks. 
Uh, and we will be uh, re replacing Harvey with Carlina to alternate with me. Uh, I'll ask the next question, which is, how do I pay my rent that is two months overdue? I'm rent stabilized. Any rental assistance for middle class seniors who are not working now due to COVID? So uh, I'll, I can start this one, and then anyone, anyone can feel free to jump in. One of the things that was briefly mentioned before was um, the citywide grants, known as one shot deals, that are available for folks who are in arrears. Um, but have future potential to pay rent. So um, if you are, if you work within an industry that once the phases of the city reopen, you are confident that you'll be able to pay rent and you're not going to get support that you may be eligible for a one-shot deal that um, we, uh, you know, mentioned before, but anyone else can also add in. Yeah, I mean, there's some organizations, I mean, I don't know what the funding is like right now, but there has been some organizations that have been able to give out hardship grants without you having to, you know, have um, future ability. But I don't know if, what the, the status is, but there might be some of those. But um, HRA is usually the, you know, Catholic Charities is another agency um, that usually helps um, with assistance. So one shot deal in those agencies. Housing Court Answers, whose phone number was on the chat a while ago, coordinates the Emergency Rent Coalition and they always know who's got money and who doesn't on a day-to-day -day basis. A reminder to organize if you can with your neighbors, you can all work together and use that power to um, hopefully come to an agreement with your landlord. Um, that's always a possibility. Okay, next question. I have lived in my apartment for 25 years and I've always paid my rent. My rent stabilized apartment lease is up for renewal July 1st. The lease is printed and ready to sign with the previous year's RBG percentage increase rates. I'm currently on furlough and would like to freeze my rent. The RBG had a preliminary vote that in May to allow for a rent freeze effective for leases beginning in October. Is it possible to receive the rent freeze for my current lease renewal July 1, 2020? I'd requested one from my landlord company 78 slash 79 York Association LLC for a rent freeze when I earned less a decade ago while in grad school and was denied. It seems reasonable during COVID-19 that I could be eligible for a rent freeze. What can be done to advocate for a rent change from a landlord company that has already demonstrated a lack of desire for rent freezes? Organize. Yeah. I don't know if you already are, but that's, that's the situation where you want to be working with your neighbors and applying more pressure to your landlord. If you are not organized and that's something you want more help with, you can reach out to our organization or I'm sure any of the others that do that work on this call mm -hmm. as well. But if there's a lack of desire, I mean, working with your neighbors who are paying and having them potentially, you know, withhold rent until they kind of offer something that would work for those unable to pay is always something that could potentially happen, so. One other thing to throw in the mix is that on New York State's warranty of habitability law lets you to get a, a rent credit if you've had conditions in your apartment. So because a July 1st renewal would be governed by last year's guidelines of one and a half percent, it wouldn't take very much to get a one and a half percent rent abatement. Uh, if you have any conditions at all, that would more than wipe out that increase. Uh, then if I was going to court, it's not something to do lightly. You'd need to get help and again, be organized. But yeah. Uh, we, we are running on the end. It's almost eight o'clock, so we will probably start losing folks, but we appreciate it. Uh, what is the difference between rent stabilized and rent controlled? Hi. So, uh, so there are about a million apartments in New York City that are rent stabilized and about 22,000 
people in New York City that are rent control. In order to be rent control, and that's the easier one, you have to have lived continuously in your apartment or succeeded to the lease of someone who lived continuously in the apartment since 1971. Um, so you, to the extent that someone in your family has been in the apartment since 1971, you are probably rent control. You would also be a statutory tenant, which means you do not get annual rent increases. Uh, rent, you don't get annual lease renewals because you don't get a lease. You might have gotten a lease in 1970 and haven't seen a lease since then. Rent stabilized tenants are, in general, people who live in buildings that have six or more units where the building was built and occupied before 1974. As long as that building wasn't deregulated, also, you might be a new building that is under some one of the uh, tax credits uh, that brings you in, like 421A or J51. It's immensely complicated to figure out if you're rent stabilized. You should reach out to HCR and see if your landlord has registered your apartment. One other thing is that rent control tenants until last year used to pay 7.5% increases every year. It was totally outrageous uh, based on a formula that was used. But one of the many things that was put in the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act last year is that going forward, starting I guess this year, rent control tenants only pay an increase equal to the average of the last five rent guidelines board increases for rent stabilized tenants. And because of the two rent freezes that the rent guidelines board had passed, I think rent control tenants this year only paid like 0.8% increases. Next question. Okay, thanks, sorry. I view myself because my apartment's very small and you hear everything. So what is a, a low rent rider and how do we acquire this? I, I don't know that a low rent I don't know that a low rent writer is a term of art. So it, it may be that someone lives in some sort of affordable housing um, and that's included, but I don't actually know what a low rent writer is. It might be, they might re be referring to a preferential rent. I think the, so. Yeah, where the landlord uh, agrees to charge less than what they claim the legal rent is. There's no way to force the landlord to give you that but under the HSTPA, people who have that, their increases can only be based on the rent they were paying last year. Before the HSTPA, the landlord could jack the rent up to what they claimed was the legal rent, and that would be up to the tenant to challenge whether that was in fact legal. And under HSTPA, a lot of those rents were not legal, but you can't. there's no way to force the landlord to do it other than by negotiation. Thank you. We're going to our, uh, I believe, maybe one of our last questions. This one came in through Facebook. I see a, a hand or two that has been raised. If you can please send over the Zoom chat your questions so that uh, we can pose it. Also, last call for folks on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, but this question came over Facebook. Uh, what about small business rent relief? And a lot of the folks who do this work are, are, are focused usually on, on residential tenants. Uh, what I can say is just we, we did a town hall with Small Business Services and our Congress member Carolyn Maloney uh, last month. And uh, the, the, the PPP money is for, uh, was for salaries that also expired on June 1st. Uh, but <clears throat> Small Business Services has a program. Uh, information is available at bencalos.com, but they will help you try to negotiate your lease with your landlord and also have additional services uh, to help small businesses. Uh, additionally, uh, we, we have Gail Brewer on this. She's been working on this since April. I was a little late to the party once they started partying on the streets in my district. But uh, starting on June 20th, I believe they have, the, the mayor has announced that they're gonna start allowing restaurants to use parking spots in front of their vicinity. Uh, so um, 
I think that's some of the stuff that we can try to do to help and I'll see if any of the other elected officials want to speak to it. I would just add, yeah, the open streets, streets for dining, it certainly is helpful. But, you know, right now when we're visiting businesses who have been, you know, had their windows smashed, I visited a dozen businesses yesterday, hundreds of examples of that. People feel like they, they really hasn't, not enough has been done and some of the PPP money that has come from Washington just isn't enough. That's the paycheck, paycheck protection program. Uh, we're trying in the council to do things to support our small businesses, including passing legislation, my, my bill uh, to suspend uh, uh, personal liability, that provision in a commercial lease, which will likely be tried in court. So stay tuned. And then, um, you know, making sure that we're trying our best to also work with our state colleagues as to how we can do some sort of subsidy program or, or really just make sure that whether it's grants through SBS that they continue to be available on a cyclical basis or in waves. And the last thing I'll add, because it's kind of a, a plug of mine is that, you know, I am very, very big on community land trusts, which is an opportunity to have affordable housing and affordable commercial spaces um, that allow businesses to stay in these communities for a long time and to thrive. And I think we have, you know, I have the best probably example in the city with Cooper Square, but there are others being worked on throughout the five boroughs. So I'm excited to uh, continue advocating for that initiative and hopefully have it restored, though the budget is a little iffy. Um, but I agree, you know, we really do have to help them out and um, uh, they're going through a lot right now, but we're going to do everything we can. Good question. There, there are a couple of quick, uh, I mean, a couple of quick things, uh, Ben Kalos. One is that the governor's office on a call today is going to be reaching out to all the insurance companies because what happens as somebody uh, said that in the past during Sandy, if you had an accent, the uh, company, insurance company could hang up on you and they did. So we need a strong uh, state uh, pressure on the insurance companies. That's one uh, for those who have insurance. Second issue is where there's a bid, there's going to be a request to use some of that funding for uh, streetscape improvement, meaning for the facades. In the past, it's not been possible. You couldn't use any money for that. So that's a possibility of changing. <clears throat> and then the third thing is, you know better than I, but I think there's some city money down the line for some of these businesses that have been hurt so badly, but everything has to be on the table. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we've gotten to all the questions that people submitted online over Zoom chat, over Twitter and Facebook. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists uh, and everyone who joined us. At one point, I believe we hit 100 when it came to Zoom and Facebook and Twitter, probably a lot more. Uh, we heard from tenants, we heard from landlords, we've heard from everyone. If there's one thing you can do, please, please, please uh, join us uh, fighting for a rent freeze at the Rent Guidelines Board. Uh, they need to hear from everyone. If they don't let you testify, you can submit your testimony anyway, I believe. Uh, so please reach out to any of the panelists who may have inspired you. Uh, we're here to help you, whether it's our borough president, Gail Brewer, our council member, Carlina Rivera, uh, Assembly Member Harvey Epstein, who it, we started this because of him six years ago. We're going to keep this going. Uh, so thank you for joining us. I also want to thank a lot of the folks in the parentheses staff uh, who have been here helping and making sure that this went smoothly. So thank you very much. Have a great evening and let's get that rent frozen. Thank you. Thank Night, you. Everyone. Stay safe.